Hi there, and welcome to another episode of World Beyond Belief. My name is Paul Marco, and I've got a special treat. You know, on this channel, we do a lot of heavy-duty work, where we look into deep and dark things, and sometimes it's not as uplifting and as happy as I want it to be. But luckily, I was contacted by a physician last week, and uh, he sent me a, a most delightful manuscript uh, book that he's written. And it's very uplifting and very inspiring. And I'd like you to meet him. So welcome to the World Beyond Belief, Dr. Scott Kobaba. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. Uh, I went over your book, and uh, it's the, one of those kind of books that you don't need to start and read from the beginning to the end. You can flip open because each story is more inspiring and more uplifting than the next one. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your book, how you, how, well, maybe, how you got into the medical profession and then what led you to bring this book forward? Sure. Uh, I'm a general doc. I've been in private practice for about 35 years. I see everything that walks through the door, and uh, I take care of adult medicine. I'm an internist, and I love what I do. And um, I've always wanted to be a doc uh, up until I got into college, and then I took some courses that I thought were a little strange and, and then got into economics. And as soon as I graduated, I wanted to go back to become like a doctor, so it took a little <laughs> while to do that, and I finally did again. And I, I was in practice for a long time before a few strange things started happening to me. I started to get some... Um, uh, oh, some, some premonitions and some things that, that I couldn't quite explain, and they were really strange. And I, I just wondered if other doctors had those experiences. And uh, while I was making rounds one morning, one of my colleagues, uh, Dave Mokel, who's an orthopedic surgeon, ran up to me and grabbed me by the arm and said, Scott, I've got this amazing story to tell you. And I said, go ahead, tell it to me. And he said, I can't tell it to you here. And I said, well, why not, Dave? And he said, well, because someone might hear me. They'll think I'm crazy. So I said, let's go into an empty patient room and, and we can talk about it. So we did and we closed the door and he said, you know, he had a, we had a mutual patient, Mary, and Mary arrested on the uh, operating table. Dave's a surgeon, so he was operating on her and she's my patient also. And he said when she uh, uh, arrested, everyone from the rooms around came in and they started to do CPR, but they weren't doing it adequately enough. And the guy that was doing CPR wouldn't stop doing it. So I, I had to push him aside and he had this really bright red hair it was very, very uh, striking red hair underneath his operating room cap. And I did, I did the CPR, then we gave her some ad adrenaline and a few other things and she, she came back, but she wasn't awake until the next day. And so when Mary was leaving the hospital, it looks like the arrest was caused by the antibiotic that she was given. She had an allergic reaction to the antibiotic and she survived the arrest and cardiologist took care of her. But on the on the discharge instructions Dr. Mokel was telling her, she suddenly interrupted him and said, Dr. Mokel, I want to thank you for saving my life. And he said, well, it was just, you know, he's a, a humble guy. It was just a, a you know, a team effort. We all got together and we, we gave you the right drugs and the cardiologist helped and so forth. And she said, no, no, I saw you push that guy aside and I saw you save my life. And by this point, Dr. Mokel got a little weak in the knees and sat down and he said, what do you mean? You saw him you saw me push the guy with the red hair aside. And she said, well, when I arrested, I must have rose up to the top of the room and I could see everything that was going on. I saw the arrest. I saw the guy that was doing CPR. And I could see that you were trying to get the pulse on me and there was no pulse. So he wasn't doing it adequately enough. And then I saw, and she mentioned thousands of, or not thousands, but she mentioned a, a, at least a dozen little minutia of things that happened in the OR that day that no one would have known had they not been right there the whole time. And by this point, what's going through Dave Mokel's mind is I'm trying to, I, I can't figure this out. How can she do this? This is not scientifically based at all. And I said, uh, and when Dave finished telling me the story and she lived and, and did very well for a long time, I said, uh, Dave, who did you tell this story to? And he said, my wife. And I said, who else? No one. And I said, why not? And again, you know, this is a crazy story. And I, no one, they would think I was crazy. You know, I'd, I'd lose my reputation as a conservative doc. So after hearing that story and a few others, I thought, boy, this is interesting. Maybe I should, maybe I should write these down, but you know, who would want to read these stories? This, this is a little crazy. I'm just a doc. I don't, I've never written anything before. But you know, doctors have um, a collection of patients just like barbers do. You know, I've got someone that does every kind of specialty or every kind of job that you can imagine. So I've got a, I've got a book publisher in my practice 
And so I, I said, you know, uh, his name is Scott. I said, Scott, can we go out to lunch sometime? And I'll, I'll, I'm going to run some stories by you to, think if, to, to see if you think that they have any value at all. And so he said, sure. So we went out to lunch and I was eating. I was really hungry that day for some reason. I was eating and I wasn't paying attention to what he was doing. And he was eating too. And I started to tell him the stories. And I told him about two stories. And I looked up and he stopped eating. He had tears in his eyes. And I said, I, w I, was, I was shocked because he was so moved by these stories. They weren't sad stories. They were just emotionally moving stories. So, and he said, you have to publish this as a book. Start <laughs> talking to other docs, start writing, and, and get this book published. And, and so I thought, well, this would be a nice six-month project, which ended up to be about almost four years <laughs> in, in the coming. And uh, I collected lots of stories. And it was kind of fun to do this because these are stories that docs don't talk about uh, to anyone. And, and Dave Mokel is a conservative, ordinary, routine doc, is very, very typical for what the, what the, what's out there, that these docs have these experiences, but don't talk about them to anyone, including other docs. So yeah, they're trying, trying to be conservative. I think the coolest thing about the Mary story is how she was after the, after but, the experience. Yeah, I didn't mention that. Mary, Mary was... Mary was not a nice person beforehand. I would always dread having Mary come into the office because she always had a complaint. I didn't do this or I didn't do that. And she always took a lot of time and it really wasn't a pleasant experience at all. And Mary wasn't the nicest person in the world. And what happened to her during the arrest is that her grandmother who had died many years before came to her while she was in this state of looking at, the, looking at herself being uh, 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 coded. And her grandmother told her that this wasn't her time to go, that she would have to come back but if she was a kind and good person, that she would save a place for her in heaven. And after the arrest, Mary became a totally different person. I named the story Mary's Christmas Carol uh, for the uh, Scrooge story, because after the uh, arrest, she was the nicest person you can imagine. She was a delight to have in the office. She'd bring us cookies. She was the, the kindest person to her widowed father. And it was a total transformation. It was, uh, she didn't live very long. She had lots of medical problems. She lived about three or four more years. But she was an amazing person after that to all of us. That's great. Uh, that's a neat part of the story as far as I'm concerned. So, so I picture all these conservative doctors going through, the, through these mind-blowing experiences and in a clandestine way coming back to, to, to Dr. Scott Kobaba and uh, slipping him this, this information and this... Is that how it was for years? Well, yeah. It what I did is uh, a few of the doc. There were a few docs that came to me with these stories, which is what got me going and with my own experiences. And then uh, after meeting with with Scott, the publisher, I decided to announce that I was doing a book because once you announce something like that, you're embarrassed if you don't do it. So I announced I'm doing a book, and I only had about three or four stories. So I used to hang out in the doctor's lounge, which is a wonderful place to hang out because it attracts all the doctors because of the things that are there, coffee, donuts, cookies, potato chips, all the good things that are healthy for you. And so I'd start in the early morning and any doctor that would come through, I would pounce on them literally. And I'd say, I'm writing a book and, I, and I'm looking for stories of things that you can't explain scientifically. And there were lots of stories that I got. And I, I wondered why doctors would want to share these stories with me. And I thought about that for a long time because we don't talk about this stuff. Doctors talk about serum potassiums. They talk about, you know, the next gallbladder surgery they're going to have and things like that. But they don't talk about these deep spiritual things. And I wondered, you know, what was it that, that caused them to, to really come out and, and actually have me be able to publish them, not only talk about them, but actually publish them. And I finally, I finally dawned on me when one of the doctors said, you know, this is a book that could change people's lives. And I, the risk of me being ostracized and, and people not coming to my practice is less than the benefit of potentially having people realize there's something else out there, there's hope in this world, and uh, you, know, you need to be, have, have, have some optimism, and there are, there's something else. There's something else out there that loves us. And so I think the doctors, I called them, I, I put a section in the book called What I Learned About Doctors. And I discovered that most doctors are what I call sappy do-gooders. They love to do good every day. They want to do some, some good to everyone they come across. They want to cure the world. And so I think the reason that they gave me these stories was they realized that they would, they would do more good than the potential harm to their practice that would occur when people found out that they listened to premonitions and dreams and things like that. 
And, and, and it turned out that there was none of them lost any patients that they're aware of. As a matter of fact, uh, after the launch, uh, lots of patients uh, uh, heralded them as, as heroes for coming, to, coming out with these things that will allow patients and doctors to have a, a, a easier conversation about spiritual things than they ever had before. So it turned out to be a good deal for the doctors and for me. Oh, I think that that's something that doctors need to go beyond their, uh, their professional scientific background and really embrace the whole world of uh, different experiences, um, even, even experiences beyond belief. I had an experience like that, actually. This was many, many years ago. I think I was like in my 20s. And uh, I had gone to a, uh, he was a, he was a guy, he was a, uh, he was a spiritual reader. He was like, uh, he was blind, but he could read your auras. And uh, it was, it was a very humble setting. This guy uh, didn't have much money. I think it was $5 for reading, but he, he was really good. He was honest and. Uh, so I was going through this experience, and he was telling me, he said, you're up around your head. Now, meanwhile, his eyes would focus opposite for me. In other words, if he'd say the right side of your head is as an orange aura, he would look at the left side. He was blind. He couldn't see physicality. So he's telling me that he says, you know, you have to really, uh, you've been reading way too many legal documents, and you need to, you need to lighten up and, uh, you know, not be so intense on that. And that, that's true. I was, I, was a, I was in a human resource department, and I had, to, I had to sift through that kind of stuff. In the middle of the reading, he looks at me straight. He says, is your father alive? I said, yes, he is. He said, you better get him to a doctor right away because he's sitting on a time bomb is what he said. Sitting on a time bomb. Interesting. So that, that evening, I called my mother, and uh, I said, is dad feeling OK? She says, well, he's having some pains in his chest. Uh, I said, would you do me a favor and see a doctor tomorrow? Because I think I have an inkling that uh, you know he needs some attention. And so she, took him. she called me the next day. She said, your dad's in the hospital. He's having a quadruple bypass. <laughs> the said he was sitting on a time bomb. Isn't that? That gives you goosebumps. It does. And, it does. And, goosebumps. and that's the kind of stories uh, that are in this book. Well, you know, like Paul. Like amazing things. Go ahead. But when I talk, I, I, I frequently tell my stories to my patients because I get excited about these stories. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing a physical or something and telling stories. And I'm always, always a little late in the office just because I, I like to chat and I tell these stories. And invariably, people that I tell these stories to have stories of their own, just like you did. And what, what these stories seem to generate would be a, a realization that, um, that the stories that people have gone through, the coincidences that they thought they'd gone through, were really not coincidental. There's something more to, to those, those coincidences than they realized. I had a, a wonderful experience a couple nights ago. My, my last daughter, I've got seven kids. I'm not sure where they all came from, but I've got seven. Some are adopted. And uh, my last one is graduating from high school this Saturday. And I was a little emotional because her last concert, she's a, she's a choir uh, person and, and she was in the choir. Her last concert was last week. I was a little emotional. And one of the girls uh, in the, in the uh, uh, choir came up to me and she said, you know, one of the um, teachers that I have for English assigned us a, a series of books to read and that we could, we could choose one. And your book was, was in there. And I was totally flabbergasted that they would actually choose my book, uh, that they would have it uh, as, a, as a choice. And she said, I'm reading it. And what I've discovered is that many of the coincidences that I thought I had uh, that were just coincidental really probably weren't. There's some things that have really helped me in my life and I said, that's exactly what I wanted to accomplish with this book, that people would realize there's something else out there that may take a part in our lives and guide us in the, in the direction that we want to go, or that, that this, this spirit or force, or most of the doctors call it God, 
uh, wanted, wanted us to go. And so that was one of the greatest compliments I could have had, I think, that, that she uh, was a changed person because of reading some of these stories. And, and again, when I, when I tell them, uh, virtually everyone has had something happen to them or their family, either an individual or family. And I think when your listeners listen to this interview, they'll be thinking about the things that have happened, the strange and strange things that have happened to them. Some will understand uh, that they, they're coincidental, but, but I think many people realize that some of these things are not coincidental. They're intended to help them move forward and, and do the, accomplish some amazing things in their lives. And I think one of the powerful things about it is that it's written by a medical doctor. Uh, and, and the fact that he's a conservative medical doctor, he's, he looks at scientific evidence, he does tests, and then all of a sudden, outside of the realm of all this stuff, there's another force working. Well, I, I tried to, I, I wanted to do the first book about doctors. I guess one of the reasons was I hang out with doctors all the time. That's why I spend my life with, with the doctors. But I thought the doctors being scientists would be a little more credible than other, than other, other groups of, of individuals. So I thought this would be a good starting point to get what are, what are considered conservative scientists to, to tell me the, their stories and uh, that they couldn't exactly explain. And, and uh, you know, if doctors have these experiences, everyone has these experiences. And, and I think doctors would be the most critical uh, in, in analyzing what, what happened to them in terms of this is, you know, whether this is scientific based or not. And so that's why I chose doctors. And the doctors that I picked also, um, I, I got, there's a, you know, in any, in any profession, there's, there, there are conservative people and they're kind of on the edge people. And uh, I picked the, the relatively conservative doctors that, that, really didn't have a reason to tell these stories, except just they, that they happened. And the, there, there's, there's some doctors that I didn't include in the book because I couldn't quite, uh, I guess they call it vetting. I couldn't quite vet them to make sure that what they were telling me was, was really the up and up stuff. And so uh, these are from doctors that I've known in many cases for 30 and 40 years. And, and you vetted them all so that they're not, uh, I don't know, wing nuts. That's hard for, for this channel because we're, we're kind of out there. Uh, we look that's at things right. a little differently. But okay. uh, there are things that are out there that we can't explain. And that's what this book's about, things that are out there. So. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the cool things about this book is if you think it's written by a physician, uh, you may think it's going to be complicated and hard to read. That's not the case with this. It's written in very elementary language. And the way I, when I read this thing, I was, I was thinking, what kind of like, you know, I think of some books as coffee table books, some books sure. as research books. Sure. This is the book you want next to your bedside at night. If you can't sleep, get on this. You don't even have to start from beginning to end. Just let it fly open. And uh, there's inspiration inside. And it makes you feel, it does. It that you uh, you welled up inside in some of these stories. Uh, uh, you can't help it; they're they're well written and well told. I'm a pretty pretty simple person, so I wanted to keep the writing uh, pretty simple. And I I thought I did. I didn't include many technical terms and so forth. But my real uh, I have to rely on my editors to to get me some uh, uh, critic to, to critique what I what I've done. And my first editor was my wife. She's a great editor. And she would say to me, I'd, I'd finish the story and say, Joan, look at this story. I think this is great. And she'd read it and she'd say, you can do better. <laughs> so re, re, redo this. It, it doesn't move me yet. And, and then I'd, I'd rewrite it a few times. And, you know, I've, I've never written a book before. This is my first book. And I never realized what it takes to, to write a book. And when you write the, I wrote each individual story uh, one at a time. And so I'd spend a fair amount of time on each story. And what I discovered is, when you write a book, at least this is what, it, what, what the way it was for me, I'd have to rewrite the story probably 15 to 20 times before I could really get that feeling. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to feel that feeling inside myself. And when I got to the right, when I finally finished uh, and, and was happy with it, there were times when I'd, I'd finish the story and there were tears <laughs> coming down my eyes from my eyes just from writing the story and, and some of the words that these doctors used. And it was uh, then I knew I had a good story. If, if I if it, it would bring me to a, an emotional 
uh, state, I knew that was a good story. So, and my wife would concur. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, they are. They're well written, well put together. The one thing I found, I found, I have two books. One was published by Sunny Public, Sun, Sunny Press. It's kind of an academic book called The Post Conventional Personality. And then I wrote one that uh, Mindy and I published called Belief Magic. And uh, one thing I found being an author is that it's much easier to write a book than it is to get somebody to read it. And so that's. <laughs> So that's what I, I want to do today. Uh, we want to try to get people to read this because it is inspiring and it's uplifting. And, it, and if you're coming from a conservative place where you're really locked down, if you're, if you're religious, it's a kind of a traditional religion. Or if you're, if you're not religious, uh, you're coming from this conservative, scientific, maybe atheist base. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of pulls you out of it. And it's an exposure to, to things that are beyond belief, that are beyond the physical. And uh, I think that's really important. That's why it's important that it comes from a medical doctor, a conservative medical doctor like yourself, Dr. Kabbalah. Well, thank you. Well, I, I wanted to have people, when they read it, read it I wanted to have, to have people think. And, and you know, I, I try not to make the book preachy. I try not to make the book religious. But I wanted people to realize that there's something else out there. And what I wanted to, to do then, whatever their belief, it doesn't matter. People, I think, might would appreciate this book, whether they're atheists or believers or any religion. And what I wanted them to do is realize there's something else. There's a force out there that's, that's above us, that looks out for us. And, and I, I wanted people to start searching for what that was for them. I didn't want to make any comments about any particular religion, but I, I think people can find... If they search, they can find what that what that is and what that 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 has meaning for them. And what I hoped to, in doing that was that people would would get this is a tough life. You know, people die, people get sick. Uh, there's lots of funny things that happen. The, the people go bankrupt and and other things that happen. And I wanted people to have hope that there was something else that um, was had meaning and gave meaning to our lives. And if if that if I accomplish that, uh, I'm delighted. So that's what I tried to do. That's great. I also want to emphasize that it's a positive force outside. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think in our, our normal days, just dealing with how the world is changing and the conflicts and the problems bearing down on all of us, we certainly can feel the negative force. Yes. That, that force, whether it's internal or external to us, I'm not sure. But it's really nice to have a little uh, positive re uh, reinforcement that there is a positive force out there, and it is watching us. And it does play a hand, although rarely, mm -hmm. in, uh, in our everyday lives. So very nice, very nicely done. Thanks, Paul. And, and I, I, to add to that, I, I think uh, if, if people really – uh, pay attention to, to what happens during their lives, I think they'll see that force more than they realize. I think there are little things that happen, uh, little coincidences, like you meet someone on the elevator and that person just mentions something about a particular uh, individual and you're looking for a job and you contact that individual and all of a sudden you've, you're, you've got the job. And I think there are little things like that that happen that if people pay attention may not just be coincidental. And so that's what I was hoping to get people to realize. There are some big things. That I, I, the stuff in the book is, uh, is the big stuff. You know, these are the big miraculous things. But there's little stuff, I think, too, that happens. And I wanted people to realize and just pay attention to that and, and realize there is something. And if people take on a, a job or a task or something that they want to accomplish, uh, it's something that's, that's good in the world, I think they get some extra help in doing that. And, and uh, to pay attention to that, too, and, and expect that, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I expect it. Uh, one thing that we've done a long time ago, Mindy and I, is we try to uh, discount coincidences. Mm -hmm. In other words, when something happens to you, don't say it's just a coincidence. Or anything. Look for deeper meaning. How is this related to something else? And, and this, this thing, what about two weeks from now? How this affected how you feel about something that will uh, come up and be important in your life. So I would suggest as a developmental 
piece of action, which is kind of my deal, mm -hmm. uh, start trying to eliminate the word coincidence and look at everything that happens to you as a, a pattern or an unfolding or leading you to something else. Yeah, I think that's, that's really an interesting thing, and we've played around with that, Mindy and I. And, you know, sometimes, Paul, you don't realize uh, until later when you look back uh, of, of actually when you're living through something, you may not realize uh, what the significance was. But when you look back, you say, oh, my goodness, that happened for this reason. And now I know why, why that particular thing happened. Um, Steve Jobs, who's not in my book, by the way, had an interesting t uh, speech at Stanford a number of years ago. And he talked about the coincidence uh, that happened to him. He dropped out of school and uh, he decided to take some classes that he would never take uh, because he wanted to take them and audit them just because he would now was out of school and he could do whatever he wanted to do. And one of the classes he took was on uh, uh, calligraphy and typesetting and things like that. And he never thought that that would have any implication in the future at all. Uh, however, fast forward about five or six years when he was designing the Mac and the, and the Apple computer, that was incredibly valuable to him to design the fonts and all the, the typing that the computer has where it used to be all this, this you know, very regimented uh, and, and, and the Apple had beautiful fonts and type. And he said, had I not been auditing that course, that wouldn't have happened uh, when I designed the Mac. And so he recognized that there was a force of some kind, he didn't know what, it, what to call it, that helped him uh, with these classes that he audited that were all beneficial in ultimately designing the Apple computer. So I think this happens to everyone. Oh, I think so too. I could probably come up with a couple coincidences that led me to whatever. Your medical degree led you to your, your being able to write this and actually look at, at doctors. Now, apparently you, you trust doctors. Yes. You're one. Yes. And, uh, but now you're seeing the doctors are seeing this world beyond. And, uh, it's hard for them to probably come out and admit it. I know we, we talked about that in the beginning. Yes. But now uh, you're kind of a catalyst for opening people up to this, uh, this kind of experience that's beyond yeah. just pure, pure physicians' yeah, work. It, it's interesting to see the change that has happened in our community since this book has come out. And the doctors were a little anxious about what's going <laughs> to you're writing this story for the world here. What's going to happen to me now? What's going to happen to my practice? And we had a number of doctors show up at the launch when we launched the book in September. And uh, it was interesting. There's only one doctor that wanted to remain anonymous because his story is about actually himself when he had a stroke. And the doctors were getting such praise for coming out uh, and revealing these stories at the launch from hundreds of people that this individual who was anonymous said, I don't want to be anonymous anymore. I want you to tell them who I am so I can be part of this movement that uh, uh, encourages patients and doctors to start talking about things that are more than just medical things. And so that's been the, that's been the case ever since the book has been published, that these doctors are really pleased with, with what's happened. And I don't think anyone's gotten any criticism at all. I certainly haven't. And I was surprised. I thought I'd get some criticism or naysayers or, you know, you wrote a bunch of crazy stories that could all be coincidental. I haven't heard that at all. Uh, it's been amazing what has happened and people are thanking me for allowing uh, them to be able to open up the conversation about spiritual things with other doctors. And so it's been, it's been fun to see that transformation. Oh, I think that when I go to see a doctor, I would like to be able to talk to him about uh, feelings I'm having or you know, I'm, 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 something's bothering me, I'm nervous lately, or I've been in an amazingly relaxed state since then, because, you know, those emotions, well, you know, you're a doctor, sure. uh, certainly impact on your physical health. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And I think some, I think there's some healing that takes place, you know, uh, uh, outside of, of pills and, and, and uh, tests and potions and things like that, that uh, we can't explain. And so I think I'm, I'm hopeful that that will people recognize that too, and and uh, and and use that to to help them get better. That's great, as long as they get better. Yes, that's the important thing. Yes, 
you know, as long as they get better. And I think this, this little book, it's, it's simple, it's clear, and it just uh, tells it like it is, I think, uh, in terms of these amazing stories. Um, you, know, you mentioned getting better, Paul. You know, there are some people that don't get better, obviously, and, and we, we do yeah. the best we can. And I tried to bring out some stories about, you know, what happens to us. And, and there are some stories in there, too, about people that have died. And, and then I think there are certain circumstances where they, they, can, they can pay attention to what we're doing in this life and may be able to participate in, to a limited extent uh, in our lives, you know, even now. And so even though there is that there is sadness, there is death, I don't think it's the end. I think there is a place where people go and, then, and they, they still can be aware of what's happening to their loved ones here on Earth. I think that's, that's an amazing statement because we're all taught, and I think physicians are, are very, this is very uh, stressed in their lives, mm -hmm. that death is a failure. It's a failure of the medical profession. Yes. It's not. It's a totally natural part of life, and we are all going to have to go through sooner or later, some sooner than others. Yes. But uh, it's it's a natural thing, and so dealing with this and having the emotional and spiritual foundation uh, to deal with death is a real important part of life. Probably more important part of life than just extending life. I mean. We've all had loved ones where their life was extended and extended and extended, and yes. they would probably have been better off departing earlier. That reminds uh -huh. me of a story from uh, Dr. Heim. He um, was skiing with his father uh, in Michigan, uh, cross-country skiing. He's a great skier, and uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon. And his father arrested on the, on the, on the path. And uh, he grabbed him and put him on his shoulders. Dr. Heim is a phenomenal athlete. He uh, actually can do a thousand push-ups and a thousand sit-ups, which is a lot more than about a thousand more than I can do. And he <laughs> he ran with his he ran with his father to the nearest to first aid station where there was a doctor there, and they they did CPR on his dad for for an hour, and his dad died. He didn't he didn't live. And Steve was devastated over that. He couldn't believe that he's a guy that, that saves lives and not loses lives. He, he took it as a personal loss that he uh, was, wasn't able to save his father. What's interesting, about two years later, he was skiing uh, in a different location of the country, in Colorado, with his sister and his sister's, uh, uh, his, his, his wife and his wife's sister, I should say. And they were skiing down a mountain, and a blizzard came up, and they, they, didn't, they didn't have... Uh, uh, any idea where they where they were going because this was a strange mountain they'd never skied it before and they came to a, a grove of trees and they had to go to the right or the left and steve went to the right and the girls went to the left and as soon as steve realized that he decided to ski back through the, the grove of trees while he was skiing he suddenly felt this emotion like something was awful that uh something awful was happening that he had, he was being called upon to do something with life and death implications and he stopped skiing and everything became quiet, and he could hear his breath. He could hear the, the uh, snow crunch underneath his boots. And he took his skis off, and he didn't know what, what to do. And he, was, he felt this urge to climb up the mountain in the opposite direction from where the girls were waiting for him. And he's climbing and walking and climbing and walking. He gets about 100 feet up the mountain, and he still has this, this feeling of, of dread inside that there's something really bad happening. And he stands in. He was standing in front of a big pine tree, and there's a tree well that comes down to the base of the tree, where the snow comes down to the base. And he and he was standing right over the tree, and he looked down. And as soon as he looked down, he knew why he was there. Underneath the tree, there was a body, covered with snow. He brushed the the snow off the individual's face, and it looked like he was dead. His uh, skier had evidently in the snowstorm. They couldn't see, and he hit the tree and was knocked unconscious. And so. He, you know, Steve is a trauma surgeon, though, interestingly, and what better place for a trauma surgeon to be than in a trauma situation? A trauma. Right. So he brushed off the snow off his face, and he, and he reached down for his carotid artery just to see if he was dead, and he felt a pulse. So the guy wasn't dead. He was hypothermic and in shock and unconscious, but he wasn't dead. So Steve knew exactly what to do. He went into trauma mode. He brushed all the snow off. He covered him with his jackets. He yelled for help. But one of the last people down the mountain heard his cries, and he came to his side and said, what should I do? And he said, go to the nearest phone and call the ski patrol. 
about 15 or 20 minutes later, the ski patrol came up with a snowmobile and a gurney, loaded the unconscious uh, hypothermic skier onto the, onto the gurney, took him down to the waiting ambulance at the lodge. They took him off to the hospital. The next day, Steve called to see if that person had lived or died, and, and they said, he's actually fine. He's awake. He's alert. Uh, he, Steve splinted his leg because it was broken uh, in the field with, a, with some underclothes and, and uh, a tree branch. And they said they were very pleased with his splinting of the leg. They didn't have to move it at all. They just recasted it because it was in the right position, and he did the perfect job doing that. And Steve uh, was, so, was obviously very relieved. And he said to me, he, he knew then that there was something else uh, uh, that's higher than us. There's an authority, there's a God higher than us. And he's convinced that this happened because he was told by God that he could save a life and that he, uh, that he, he knew then, he learned then, and he felt it in, in inside that his dad's death was not caused or, or not his fault, that it was his time to go and that he was given a second chance to save a life, and he did accomplish that. So in that day, there were two lives that were saved, this, the, the skier that had hit the tree, and then Steve, who had realized that uh, this was his second chance from some something above that was looking out for him. And so two lives were saved that day. Yeah, very inspiring. I've got somebody in the chat that asked us, how can we get your book? It's available through Amazon. Uh, it's the main place to get it. Uh, it's well, available as a Kindle and a soft cover. And then uh, there are other place outlets that have it online, uh, uh, Barnes and Noble, a few others. But the, ba the, the main place would be, uh, would be Amazon. Physicians okay. Untold Stories. Do you have a website? We do. It's called physiciansuntoldstories.com, and it's also available through the website. Thanks for mentioning that. There are lots of blogs on there and lots of... Uh, uh, podcasts and, and interviews and, and some of the videos that we did uh, uh, about the stories in the book, the Steve Heim stories on, the, on, on there too in video form. So it's kind of fun to see that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, would you like to sum up by saying anything about the book? I thought it was great. Thank I you. personal advocate it. Thank you. You know, it was it was fun to write, and you know, Paul, you never quite when you write a book, and you probably experienced this too. What I did is, I just collected stories, and what I did is, when when the docs would tell me a story, I used the criteria: if it made me cry out of emotion, not out of sadness, but if it made me cry or gave me goosebumps, that was the story. And I knew right away if they told me the story, and I, I welled up in tears, I'm going to put that story in the book. And so that was that was my criteria, and you never quite know what. These were just a collection of, of random stories. I, I just picked the ones that I thought were the most uh, emotionally exciting and, and uh, uh, moving. And when you get done and you have all these collection of stories, you, you don't quite know what the bottom line is. And I think what's, what's emerging is the, the bottom line in the book is there's something else out there. Uh, God, doctors call it God, but you can call it whatever, whatever force you want to call it. It's, a, it's a, something that's strong, higher and stronger than us and looks out for us that people that have died, uh, still uh, there's a place for them, and they still are aware of what's happening uh, to us, and, and they can participate in our lives, sometimes in strange and wonderful ways. That I want people to look at coincidences in their lives and realize that some of those coincidences may not be coincidental. And I think if people set out to do something that's, that's really important, that's going to be significant in their lives, or their families, or, their, or, the, or the world, that's funny and strange and amazing things will happen on that journey. And that's happened to me. There are some strange and wonderful things that have happened to me that I couldn't explain in writing this book. And I think that happens to everyone that sets their mind to do something really important or really significant. They get, they get some help uh, that's over and above what they would normally expect. And I, I think they should expect that kind of help. Uh, when things are looking down, count on something or, or someone or this force, this God, to, to help you accomplish uh, some good things. And so those are the things that are the bottom line for the book. And what I hope and what's, what's so far happened is that when people read the book, they have hope, that they, that they realize that there's something else out there, that whatever's happening to them, whatever bad things are happening to you in your life or whatever has happened to you in the past or if you're guilty about something or whatever, this book gives you hope and, and peace and that love is the most powerful force in the universe and that this, this book is is about love and that's that's what i that's what i've, I've I, I think i hope people get that from, from the book 
Well, that's that's wonderful. Mindy just wrote me a little note. She says, I teared up several times during the book. I know I was emotionally involved with it, and uh, it really gets to you, but it really works. And your last little statement is worth the whole interview right there, because that's you. where we're all going. And I know this is a time when it's not easy to get through life. Things yes. are tough. Yeah. And you need to know that there's something more than you out there. Yes. And uh, don't deny it. Uh, just live with it. Look for it. Don't attribute everything to coincidences. And uh, get a book called Physicians Untold Stories, Stories by Dr. Scott Kobaba. Thank Thanks, you very Mark. much, Dr. Scott. Thank you. It's Take care. Great interview. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.